Praise the Lord, everybody. It's good to see you guys here on a Wednesday night. Or no, no. <laughs> it's untrue. It's totally Sunday. I, I know if you are here, you are seeking and you want more. This is this group of people are hungry. And I know that God's prepared for you to be fed. So let's go ahead and stand to our feet and make a decision that we will leave here changed as he designed. Amen. There is a river where goodness flows. There is a fountain that drowns sorrows. There is an ocean deeper than fear. The tide is rising.
He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took the keys back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took the keys back. Come on. He walked right up to the gates of hell. And he took the keys back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. And he took the keys back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. And he took the keys back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. And he took the keys back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. And he took the keys back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. And he took the keys back. He walked right up to the gates of hell and he took the keys back. He took the keys. He took the keys back. Oh yeah. Oh, somebody in this place. Somebody needs freedom in this place. Amen. I know there's freedom in the river. 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 Oh, I know there's freedom in the river. Oh, there's freedom. I know there's freedom in the river. Oh, there's freedom. I know there's freedom in the river. I know there's freedom in the river. Come on. So he walked right up to the gates of hell. He took my family back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took my family back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took my family back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took my family back. Come on. He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took my family back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took my family back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took my family back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took my family back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took my family back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took my family back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took my family back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took my family back. Take your family. He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took your family back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took your family back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took your family back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took your family back. Hey, 
took my family back. Well, he walked right up to the gates of hell. He took your family back. Well, he walked right up to the gates of hell. He took my family back. Well, he walked right up. Any prodigals in this place today? Hey. Well, he walked right up to the gates of hell. He took my family back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took my family back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took my family back. He walked right up to the gates of hell. He took my family back. Oh, Jesus in the river. Oh, I met Jesus in the river. I met Jesus in the river. Hallelujah. I met Jesus in the river. Somebody in this place. I met Jesus in the river. Mm. I met Jesus in the river. I met Jesus in the river. I met Jesus in the river. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, come on. Somebody raise a hand to the Lord this evening. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give him praise today. Hallelujah. As they were singing that song, I began to think about Lazarus. And Jesus stepped onto the scene and he said, Lazarus, come forth. He could have stopped right there because he put life back into the dead. But what he did is not only did he put life back into the dead, he said, loose him. He, gave, he took the bonds that was holding him in death and took it off. There's one thing to take Jesus to somebody, but there's another thing to take the liberty of the freedom of bondage being taken off because of him. That's what Brother Dolman does in Mexico. Not only does he take the freedom and the liberty and the life-giving blood of Jesus Christ, but he gives them the opportunity to step into the Holy Ghost and be free from the bondage of poverty. But it doesn't mean that they're full of money in their pockets. But he gives them joy through the Spirit of God because he presents not only liberty, life, but freedom from bondage. So we want to take an offering for Brother Tolman this evening. And I think it goes to the fish. If you're going to go tonight, if you're going to go through, I'm sorry. Oh, if you're going to go through tonight only. It goes to the fish if you're going to do it on your phone or write a check. Write a check to Brother Tolman or here. Okay, if you're going to write a check, write it here. If you're going to go online, text, put it to the fish, mark it there. But we want to give this work. Uh, Brother Tolman and I met a couple years ago. He came over when we were over in Salem. What, you, what an absolute wonderful work you're going to see what he's been doing in Mexico. And so we want to be able to give him a blessing from the Lord. Not a, an offering, but a blessing from the Lord. So if you would, if you would just join with me in prayer that, we, that, that the Lord will bless Brother Tolman in this service. And I think next Sunday we're going to do another offering as well. So if you have an offering tonight, I would ask that you would give it. But let's just lift a hand to him this evening. Mighty God. Lord, we thank you for the work that you have done, not just within the borders of our country, but, Lord, throughout this world. Lord, that there is a harvest that is, that is white and ready to be harvested today. Lord, for men and women that will step out into the unction and the following of the Holy Ghost, to be able to leave their homes and step out and bring your word towards people that are hungry for you. Lord, as we take this offering this evening, I ask that you bless it. Bless it to the work in Mexico today. Lord, allow this service to continue. We give you the glory and the honor in Jesus' precious name. Find me in the valley, standing with my hands held high. The valley will never take my song. Find me in the desert, holding on to you for life. The desert will never take 
my song Oh, the desert will never take my song And I will praise you I will praise you I won't let the storm Dancing where you prophesy, still shout, still shout with everything you've done. High above the mountain, high as great to testify. Forever, you will have my songs. Forever, forever. My song, and I will praise you. And I will praise you. I won't let the stones cry. I won't let the stones cry out. And I will praise you. It's something. The stronger my faith grows, the higher the need, the higher I'll reach, the higher I'll reach, the greater the cost, the greater the cost, the more I believe for, the longer the wait, the longer I'll pray, the stronger the the stronger my faith grows, the higher the need, the higher I'll reach, the greater the cost, the more I believe for.
and your voices right now. Let's praise the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Let's not let the stones cry out in our place. Hallelujah. I want to worship him right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. This is Pentecost Sunday night. Amen. Man, can I feel the Spirit moving in this place. There's not many people right now in this place there's a lot there's hundreds watching online i know but my goodness i can feel the whole ghost moving in this place Whew. i think that the spirit that was here this morning is just has been waiting here for us to return amen hallelujah hallelujah you may be seated for just a moment as you all know we have we're privileged very privileged. It's been a very long time since we've had an opportunity to have a missionary or any, anyone from overseas because of the pandemic. So we are very glad to have Brother Stephen Tolman. Come on to the platform, brother. Let's give him a, give him a hand tonight. And before he comes, I'm just going to come and ask him to take his liberty in the Lord tonight. But before he comes, I want to just talk to the church about what a missionary represents, what a missionary truly represents. And you know, I may never, I may and I may not ever go to Africa and preach. You may or may not ever go to Africa and, and, and teach or to Mexico or to South America or to wherever. If God calls me to be a missionary, I'd hope it's like to Jamaica, you know. But I feel like I'm a missionary to Brian. What a missionary overseas really represents is a great opportunity for you. Because someday I intend to go to heaven. I intend to see the Lord face to face. And I hope, I hope that whenever I turn around that there are people coming through the gates from Mexico. Hope there are people coming through the gates from Africa and South America that I've never met that will come up to me and say, I'm here because you gave. I'm here because you, you made it possible for that missionary to come and witness to me and preach to me and preach the truth of repentance and baptism in Jesus' name and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. This is an opportunity for us, for each one of us to take somebody with us. And every one of you who wrote a check, every one of you who put money in the plate, and every one of you who gave online tonight, and we'll do another offering next week whenever much more of us are here but it's an opportunity for you to take somebody with you. Opportunity that whenever you get to heaven, you can turn around and they're going to say, you know what, I'm here. You've never met me, but I'm here because you gave. <laughs> Amen. Brother Tolman, come and take your liberty tonight. Thank you for coming.
my voice sounds better with 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 these uh, little things on top of the, top of the mic. I'm so glad to be here. It's it's a, it's a pleasure. It's a joy. I've not been in in this building before, but I'm glad to be able to come here and meet you. Uh, I'm Stephen Tolman, and my family is is my wife Marcella, uh, my children uh, Lisa, Timothy, and, and Peter. They're all working with us together in the in the ministry in Mexico. And before I I start into the message, I want to show a little bit of what God is doing in Mexico. If if you can put up the PowerPoint, let's see if it'll come through. We're Seed Time and Harvest Ministry. Next slide. Uh, the ministry team. Uh, the, some of the pictures did not come through, so don't don't worry about that. That's my wife and I, uh, Marcel and I. Paco is my son-in-law, and my wife and my daughter uh, Elisa, Valdivia. Lily Castellanos is is my sister-in-law. Paco and Delia are two people, which are what we call our street kids. When we moved to, to San Pedro, you've got to understand, San Pedro is a place in the high desert in the center of Mexico. And uh, we moved from the city of Tepic, which is subtropical. God moved us there. And it was a whole miracle how he, how he got us there. But we started working with kids on, on the streets. Uh, the area had a, had a huge drug problem. We started working with, with uh, a drug rehab and things like that but as we began to get more and more kids in kids who didn't have families and we started raising them and that and a lot of, the, of these kids we put through school and they got married and the, many of them moved out to other cities because uh, there's a high immigration rate there but uh, several have, have stayed and they've developed into ministry and we thank God for that next slide let's see if it can change The problem is, is, is that I did this on Windows, and I believe uh, everybody's got, got uh, Mac, and I don't have Mac. Okay, yes, the next slide, I think, is going. Okay, yes. Uh, our main church is Templo Cristiano Libertad. Libertad is, is freedom, freedom uh, Christian temple. We're called freedom because we live on Freedom Street. That, that literally, the, the, the name of the, of the street is Freedom Street, and so we, that's the name of, of the church. Uh, we have weekly services. Even in, in COVID, we were able to, to divide up the, the, the church in, in multiple cell groups. I brought in, I, I got 15 leaders and we divided the church into groups of, of 10 or less people. And, and they had to pastor those, those, those people. And since May, we have grown 30%. In COVID, we grew and we thank God for that. We're involved in missions. We send out missionaries. We have many sister churches. We work with addiction recovery. We do a lot of soccer outreach. We do a lot of out outreach through, through soccer and uh, outreach in eight developmental areas and to local people. We were, th between ourselves and our sister churches, we probably handed out more than 3,000 um, uh, groceries or helped more than 3,000 families th with groceries in this, in this time because when COVID hit, uh, there were whole neighborhoods where people were just closed in. And, and you go down the street and you'd see a sign on the door that says, we're hungry, we can't get out. And so we would take food to, to, to those people. Next slide. Okay, well, who are we? <clears throat> we're a lot of things. The guy who you see standing at the, at the bottom, he was a gang member and, and he got a brain tumor. He was, it was operated on and they said he had no hope and God healed him. And we, we thank God, and he's serving God strongly today. We do a lot of soccer ministry. You can see uh, some groceries which we're giving there. This is uh, one of our soccer schools in, in Honduras. And, and God is expanding the work more than we can even imagine. Next, next slide. So <clears throat> I'm uh, greatly involved lately in pastoring pastors and in leadership training. The man which you see baptizing there, uh, he is the the general director of Airmark in, in all of Latin America. He's over many thousands of employees, but he's also the pastor, the main pastor of the church in, in Monclova, and that church has really grown. In the past seven years, it's gone from nothing to over 1,200, and, and we thank God for what God is doing. There. It's, in, it's in a great revival. Uh, the young man which you see standing up on the far side, his name is Adolfo. He's one of our street kids. We raised him from the time he was 10. We put him through 
uh, university, uh, through school and then through university. He has a double doctorate in, in biochemistry. And he uh, he's a fantastic Bible teacher. And he's Mex one of Mexico's top um, biochemical researchers. And he's given um, lectures in Oxford, in, in Harvard, in uh, in different universities in Mexico, and he's published 20-some different pa papers already. And he's one of our street kids. <coughs> uh, but we, we, we do a lot of leadership training. We pour into the lives of, of, of these people in small groups and in larger areas. And, and as we send them out, I have to go and pastor the pastors, if you understand what I'm saying. And so I'm constantly visiting, constantly talking with them. Uh, I'm constantly on, on, on video conferences, especially right now in, in COVID, on video conferences. My, my Tuesdays are, are full of, of video con conferences, four to five video conferences on, on, on Tuesdays, where I meet with different uh, leaders that we have in different parts of the country and different parts of the world. Next slide. And so as we're, we're training leaders, we do it in smaller groups. That's in a, in a, actually in a factory where we're doing leadership training there in a, in a factory. And the other was just before everything was shut down with COVID, we had a conference, a leadership conference in the city of, of Monclova. That's over 1,200 people which were at the leadership conference, government officials, uh, management people from, from large companies, very large companies. And, and they all come to get Bible-based leadership training. And, and we present the gospel to them in, in, in these leadership training sessions. And, and we pray with them afterwards, and many people come to the Lord through this. Next slide. We have a professional soccer ministry. <coughs> uh, we have a second division soccer team. Second division would be like double-A uh, baseball, uh, that, that, that level of, of playing. And it's, it's a good fishing hook. We started soccer to, to get kids off the street. We worked a lot with rehab. We work a lot with, with rehab. But... Prevention is much better than, than rehab. Many people feel that the greatest testimony is, is, is when God brings you out of something. But I say the greatest testimony is when God keeps you from something. It's the greatest testimony you can have. And, and so we start working with kids and through, through soccer. Actually, I tried to do baseball first, but uh, I couldn't get them to practice baseball five days a week. But soccer, I could. And so we went into soccer, and the ministry started growing from one team to, to several teams, to 50-some teams, and then finally we got a, a, a third division soccer team. We won all of Mexico, and we ascended up to second division. And uh, our team is known all over Mexico as God's team. <laughs> the guy who you see heading the ball there, uh, he called me just as I was leaving the country. The, and, and he's in a He's on a team, a higher level team right now playing. And he said, uh, Brother Stephen, he said, I need to be baptized. And I said, well, I'm leaving the country right now. He said, but as soon as you get back, can you baptize me, please? Of course, you will be baptized in Jesus' name. Next slide. And through the soccer ministry, we have a, a school of coaches where we start training people to, to train kids. It's a great way of, of, of getting kids. We have soccer schools in the United States, in Mexico, and in Honduras right now. We, will, uh, we were supposed to open soccer schools in Algeria, Morocco, and in Egypt this, this year. Uh, but due to COVID, we had to, we had to uh, postpone those, those, those plans. But we're training people to go into these areas and through soccer present the gospel of Jesus Christ. Anybody who goes into our soccer program has to go into, uh, we have daily Bible devotionals which, which go there. We have to learn how to pray. And we, we present Jesus. In the, in the Muslim countries, we do not uh, go in as presenting ourselves as Christians. We go as uh, presenting ourselves as disciples of Jesus Christ. And, and, and they accept it. As disciples of Jesus Christ, okay, it's fine. Uh, Christianity, uh, they, they had that problem with the word Christian. So we just say we're, we're disciples of Jesus Christ. We're followers of Jesus. And, and it's, a, it's creating a, a tremendous door to go into Latin America people, Latin American people into these Muslim countries a lot easier than we can send Americans in. And they can live at, at the level of the people and it doesn't affect them. And, and this is a way which we are presenting the gospel in different parts of the world now. Next slide. And this, the school of coaches is to present missions. Uh, I'd like to point out the girl who's, who's in, the, in the head covering there. <coughs> 
That's actually a picture of, of Patti. This was a few years ago. She's one of our street kids. She came in through soccer. She was, uh, she hated God, anything to do with God, because let's just put it this way, she had been abused every which way you can imagine and from the time she was a small child. And God miraculously touched her life through soccer and, and she gave her heart to the Lord and then she won her family to, 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 to the Lord. And she finally went out to the mission field, first to Haiti and then to, uh, to the Philippines. And there she's in, in the Mindanao area, the Muslim area of the Philippines. She's up in, a, in an Abu Sayyaf camp. Abu Sayyaf is the Al-Qaeda or the ISIS of, of, of the Philippines. They are fighting, they are terrorists fighting for an independent Islamic state in the south of the Philippines. And she's up in the main camp. And she stayed in the house of the main leader of Abu Sayyaf for two weeks. And she and another girl, Filipino girl, were up there teaching the kids first aid and Jesus. First aid and Jesus. From a street kid in Mexico to the camps of Abu Sayyaf. This is what God is doing when, when we reach the, these kids. And so we, we train up, we, will be sent, we, we, are, we send out missionaries, and we will be sending out more missionaries as soon as the world starts opening up. Next slide. This <coughs> will be uh, one of our mission, our mission training school. We just built this. We need to build one more. Uh, it's four classrooms in there. And, and so we'll be using this for our soccer coaches and for missions training and a multi-purpose building. We're trying to get it done. The second story is not done yet. Uh, you can see the stairs are up, but I need to put um, cement on the, on the stairs on each step. But still, we're, we're getting it done, and, and we thank God for that. That's a need which you can remember, you can remember us and, and, and that need. Next slide, please. Uh, we still send people out to, to start new works at Ciudad Victoria, which is, which is from Monterey, about three hours east. It's just up in the mountains from, from the Gulf Coast. It's in an area which is very cartel-controlled. Con, con, and there you have Rolo Ham, and he left everything to to begin to work amongst indigenous people who, who live in the, in the city areas. And he started a mission, and, and from that one mission which he started uh, la last year, he now has five different small missions going in a, in a church which he just finally built with, it, with his hands. You could see them bu building the, the, uh, the uh, church there. And it's a man who, I'd, who I'm pastoring almost every day. Almost every day he calls, and, and, and we go over Bible, we go over... Uh, we go over what God's doing. We, we go over all any questions which he has. And it's through long distance, but I'm pastoring him and developing him into ministry through Zoom calls, through uh, phone calls and everything. And God's doing a good work in him. Next slide. Another mission we have <coughs> is where the Huddlesons were. And I say were because the Huddlesons are moving. Um... When they came down, we said, one year, you're going to be in a mission. You're going to be working there. You're going to be learning. And after a year, they've been a year now. It's 11 months, but it's close enough to a year. And they'll be going to another area of Mexico where they, sh they shall be starting a, a new missions. And, and God has opened up some tremendous doors there. But in NASA's, you can see Sammy. He's one of my street kids there. And, and he and his wife went into that area. It's a cartel-controlled area. Um, and God has given us favor in that area and, and, and the church which was empty in, Tor in the city of Torreon in a, in a, in a um, shanty town you could say that was a church which, which we helped start. You can see it's, it's the tallest building in the area. Uh, we do use pallets very creatively <laughs> but uh, we, now, we now have a building there in that area. The, you can see the, 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 the church also the, the church in Monclova and, the, and, the, and a, another church in, in the city of, of, of Torreon. The church in Monclova is doing around 1,200. The one in Torreon is doing around 750 people. Next slide. This is how we have to have services in Monclova now. Uh, you can see the cars are socially distanced. <laughs> I, guess, I guess the virus hits cars too. It sure hits the computers. <laughs> But uh, we have to have the vehicle socially distanced. Let's see if it can, can, the, can the video come. It can't, okay. But if you can see it, we're on eight acres, and, and uh, people come in their cars, and they put on the FM, and they, and they listen to the service. And you see hundreds of cars full of people, every, every service there. 
and, and people come in into that, that lot to pray. And, and you see the cars coming in and, and people getting out and kneeling around their cars. It, during the week, it, it's a fantastic thing to see. You see men, uh, Monday through Friday, men are, are, are there at 5 o'clock in the morning and they pray for an hour before they go into work. And you see two, 300 men out there praying. And you say, why do they grow? Because they know how to pray. They know how to pray. And we have just bought a, a tent there, which will seat 3,000 people. And, and um, we don't have, it's growing so fast right now, we, we're not going to build the building until we know what, what the growth will, will be like. Next slide. We work a lot with addiction recovery. Next slide. Uh, we have girls and guys. <coughs> We bring Jesus to them. We use a celebrate recovery type, type system, but it's it's this inpatient. It's three months closed in. These people uh, come in. They have addiction problems with many different things, and we have about 20 girls and, and 50 guys right now, in, in 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 the rehab. Next slide. And you can see how God is changing their their lives, and you can see the the, the joy in their face. It's a it's. It's something which is tremendous to see how God changes lives. He can take the most broken life and make it new. Next slide, I believe that's I believe that's the final one. Yes, that's the final one. And so that's just a brief overview of, of, of what we're doing in Mexico and what God is, is doing. Things are, are growing very, very greatly. Like there in the rehabs, we also teach them music. We're, we're looking for more and more guitars because we need the rehab. We had about 20 people, and in the time of, of COVID, we've gone up to 70. We've had to move the, the rehab center we have in, a, in a new place. We took over a kindergarten, which uh, went bankrupt, a private kindergarten, which went bankrupt, and, and we took over that area, and, and we made a, a dorm for girls and a dorm for guys, and, uh, and it's filled up. It's filled up. I'd like to talk, speak a little bit today about fear and faith. Fear and faith. Let's go to Hebrews 11, verse 1 and then verse 6. I'm going to have the, the verses put up on here because I'm going to go through a lot of verses, but they, these will be my, my main verses which I go. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Let's go to Job chapter 3 verse 25. For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me. And what I dreaded has happened to me. Lord Jesus I just thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray right now that it be your words, not my words. Anoint my mouth to speak your words. I don't have words to say, but you do. Lord, touch our hearts that we receive, our minds that we understand, our lives that we apply your word, and that you change us by your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The Bible teaches a lot about how to live by faith in God. And have our faith in God. Our relationship, which we have with God, is based on faith. We have never seen God. No one has seen God. But we know that God is real. There's many arguments which we, which we can have about, about uh, how God is. Well, there's many arguments that we, we, which we can say that it's explained that, that God exists. And that you have the congruence ar argument. You've got the... the um, You've got the design argument. You've got all these different uh, theological arguments which, which, you can, which you can give about why God exists. Uh, design, you see the church and this church, you say, well, who made it? Because you know that this church just didn't come together because somebody threw up a stack of wood here. It didn't happen that way. It, it, it's cause. There's a cause and there's a design. And we look at creation, we know there's a cause and a design. We can go through all these, these theological arguments, but the best argument which you can give for believing in God is personal experience. No one can deny your personal experience. 
They can try to argue with theological things. They can try to argue with, with, with philosophical arguments. But no one can deny what God has done for you. I know God is real because I know He healed me in 1995 when I had two weeks left to live and I weighed less than 100 pounds and God picked me up and God healed me. I felt the fire go through me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. And I know that God is real. We know that God is real, but we have to believe in it. We have to have that faith. It's like, it's like the wind. We can't see the wind, but we know the wind is real. We can't see God, but we know He's real because I feel Him. I know He's here. No one can tell me that, oh, well, are you sure that God exists? I know He exists. He's been too real to me. But many times, unfortunately, as Christians, we live in more fear than we live in faith. We're more afraid of, of what's happening and what's going to happen. And our faith in God trembles a little bit because we're fearful of the circumstances around us. We live in an, in an, in an area of we live in an area which for a good while was very violent. In 2013, when, when uh, the violence was at, at its greatest level, I did 38 funerals in three months. 36 were gunshot victims. Violence was all around us. At our rehab center in Torreon, which we had at that time, which we had to close down, uh, the first girl which we ever had in rehab, because we only had men's rehab, and finally we let a girl in. And she was taken from the center two weeks before her 15th birthday. And because she refused to go back into the cartel and refused to go back to be an assassin, which she was, she had killed six men already. They said the only way you could get out is if you kill your sister, your mother, or you die yourself. And she said, I'll, I'll die. They gave us her head back in a plastic bag. These things can cause fear. But God does not want us to live in fear. Fear you cannot see also, just like you can't see faith. But fear is real. And we must avoid a spirit of fear. So what is faith then? What's the definition of faith? What's the definition of fear? You can put this up. I believe it's the next slide. What's the definition of faith? What's the definition of fear? Well, let's just, it basically we can say faith is the belief that something which has not happened will become reality in the immediate or distant future. That's, that's a basic definition of faith. Belief that something which has not happened will become reality in the immediate or distant future. Then what is fear? Fear is a belief that something which has not happened will become reality in the immediate or distant future. You say, well, that's the same definition, same meaning. The difference between the two is not the definition. The difference is the root. The difference is where it comes from. And God has called us to live in faith and not in fear. Fear is founded on the things of this world. Fear is founded on, on trusting more in the evil of the, of the devil than the, than, the, than the goodness of God. Fear concentrates on failure. <coughs> fear will tell you, you know what? You have failed before, you're going to fail again. Fear will tell you, you know what? You failed before, you're going to fall again. There's no use serving God because you're going to fail again. That's fear. Fear will tell you, you know what, there's a pandemic here and you, you better just close yourself in and don't talk with anybody because it, you're going to get sick and you're going to die. You say, but it's real. Yes, it is real. I've had to bury a lot of people in this pandemic. And I've seen people who God has healed and have risen up from the ventilators. But the thing is, fear closes us in. 
Fear tells us, you know what, we can't do anything right now because we're in, we're in a pandemic. And so we've got to wait until the pandemic ends so that God can move. But I'm telling you right now that God can move in the middle of the pandemic. We know that. <laughs> Fear concentrates in destruction. Job lost everything. But what was the, the root or the cause of him losing everything? He opened a door to the enemy when he said, The thing I feared has greatly come upon me. He was fearful that his children would walk away from God. So he was constantly making sacrifices for them. He was fearful of losing his, his, his position and his wealth because he had a lot of confidence in that. But he had greater faith in God than he had fear of that. But he had fear. And that fear allowed the devil to come in and do horrible things in his life. We're afraid of destruction. We're afraid of losing everything. We're afraid of losing our pension. Of lo losing our, our medical insurance. And God, I can't do that because I got a good job. And if I do that, I'm going to have to change my jobs and I'm going to lose my medical insurance. I'm not against medical insurance. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not preaching against medical insurance. I've got medical insurance myself. But we can't live in fear. We can't live in fear. Fear concentrates on shame. Shame from what we have done. Embarrassment that people might find out and know some hidden things in our lives. Many Christians live with hidden sins and they're fearful of people finding out about them because it embarrasses them. And because it embarrasses them, they never become free of the fear of being found out because they have not confessed. They hide it. But now I'm digging a little bit too much. We have fear of pain. Fear of vain imaginations which come and torment us. And things which wake us up at night and we can't get back to sleep because of the fear. John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, The thief does not come except to steal, to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and may have it more abundantly. We don't have to let the enemy steal and destroy but when I live in fear, I'm drawing my spiritual uh, uh, alimentación. I don't know how to say that in English. I'm drawing my, 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 my spiritual strength from the wrong source. I'm not drawing it from the Word of God. I'm not drawing it from the Holy Ghost which flows through me. I'm not drawing it from time and prayer. I'm drawing my strength from things of this world which control my mind and my spirit more than the Spirit of God. Faith is founded on knowing God and His Word. Faith is based on a relationship of love and confidence in God and His promises to us. I know who I am believed. I just, I jumped ahead, sorry. So faith is based on knowing God. We must know God. There's one thing knowing about God, but there's another thing knowing God. There's a huge difference between knowing about a person and knowing a person. Brother Walt and I have got a great relationship. He's my personal pastor. We have known each other for many years. And I know a lot of little details about him. I don't know everything, but I know a lot of little details. And he knows a lot about me. And that's caused a great friendship. He presented me to a person today, and he, he said, now this person, this and this and this, and, and I went and prayed with them, and, and I know that God, God touched them. I know God, God works in their life, but I don't know them. I know about them. But faith is based on knowing God. 2 Timothy 1.12 says, for this reason I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know in whom I believed, 
And I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Faith is based on knowing God, believing God. Believing is active. Believing is not passive. You've got to show action in your faith. You cannot have faith which is passive. You cannot have belief which is passive. Too often we say, I believe God, but we don't believe God because our actions show that we don't believe God. We must have actions which show that we believe that God is and God will do whatever He has promised to do in our life. We know that, 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 that He is faithful. But Paul said, I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that He is able to keep what I've committed to Him until, until that day. Because I know in whom I have believed. My faith is based on knowing God. Based on my relationship with God. So then how do I make my faith stronger than my fear? I'm going to give a, just a few pointers on how to make your faith stronger with your fear. First of all, I start every day with God. I must start every day with God. Too often we start our day with Good Morning America or Fox and Friends. I'm sorry, none of those, those will give me faith in God. We must start with His Word. In, in, in Mexico, we, in, in, in a factory right, right, right close to our house, we have devotionals every morning for the workers before they, they go into to work. It's a factory of about 1,000 workers, and <clears throat> we have maybe 50, 60 workers who, who come in for the devotional every morning. And so I have people who are doing the, the devotionals. I did it for, for three years, and then I, I have people start going in and doing it. But I, I decided I can't get up at 7, 8 o'clock in the morning when they're there at 6 o'clock in the morning giving a devotional so that before the factory starts working at 7. Monday through Friday, they're there at 6 o'clock in the morning to give a devotional. And I can't stay in bed while they're giving a devotional. And it's come to the point now where every morning at 5 o'clock, I'm awake. I'm awake. Now it's 4 o'clock. <laughs> I've got to start my day with God. I've got to start my day with God. I need His Word in me. I need time with God. And if I want to make my, my faith stronger than my fear, I've got to start my day with God. Facebook does not give me the voice of God. Facebook gives me the, 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 the newest gossip. Facebook is full of fear. So many things which people publish it's about things which can go wrong or things which are happening. And as I travel through the United States, I see fear grabbing the church because they're more worried about elections. They're more worried about, about political situations than they are concerned about having the strength of the Word of God in their life. We don't start our day with our horoscope. Oh, I just read it because it's funny. I'm sorry, it's devilish, diabolic. It's from the pits of hell. And if you start even reading it as a joke, you're starting to feed yourself from the wrong source. Fear and faith, same definition. It's the source you're pulling it from. Psalm 5.3 says, My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you. I will look up. In the morning we can't forget that 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 we must start the day in the morning. Psalm 63, it's not, a, it's not on there, but it says, uh, early, oh, you, oh God, you are my God, early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. I need to start my day with that desire that I need time with God. So often we don't hear God's voice simply because we don't start our day with God. I came into, into the States uh, a week ago Thursday. And God told me to, to, to cross on Thursday morning. I'm not an American citizen. They're not allowing non-American citizens in for, for non-essential things. And I arrived there and, 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 and I'm going to go be preaching in a church in Nashville because I was, I was with Brother DJ. And that's not essential. I went through five filters. But God said, you're going to go. I had five different people also, 
before then, which had called me and said, you can't cross because the borders are closed. You can't cross because the borders are closed. And the final man, said, uh, he said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going up to Nashville to preach. I'm programmed to preach. I've got to go. And he said, I've, and after you're finished in the States, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to go home. He looked at the other guys. He said, he's going home. Travel through to Canada. It's essential travel. So you can go on. I kept quiet. I never said anything about going to Canada. I'm not going to Canada. He said I was going to Canada. <laughs> but the thing is, God told me to cross on that Thursday. I crossed on that Thursday. Friday, at that same border crossing, because of a spike in, in, in coronavirus, they closed the border down totally. But I got across. God speaks to us. But we must start each day listening to his voice. So the first, to make my faith grow stronger than my fear, I started every day with God. Second, I see the good that God is working in us, even in the bad times. Romans 8.28 says, For we know that all things work together for the good for those who love God, to those who are, who are the called according to his purpose. God is a master of bringing good out of bad situations. God is a master bringing good out of bad situations. Shortly before the violence started in Mexico, the, the cartel wars and everything really badly, there was a, a person involved in the narcotic exporta exportation trade in our town. And he came to my house one day with his henchmen. And he said, Stephen, you're going to give me 250,000 pesos or I'm going to kidnap your kids. My first thought was I'm going to rebuke him in Jesus' name. I had had bad things happen. I had, had rebuked people in Jesus' name before, and I'd seen them even freeze up and not be able to move to do the violence against me. I had guns pulled on me. I had a gun pulled on me once, and the guy pulled the trigger, and, and, the, first bu and the bullet jammed. I had, I had guns at my head and on my back, and I, and I looked at them and said, uh, if, if God gives you permission, you can pull the trigger, but every drop of blood's going to say that Jesus loves you and I love you too. And then they put the gun down and say, you really are a Christian? See, tell, tell me about your Jesus. But this time, I was going to resist, and I called my dad. I believe I called you too. I can't remember. And uh, my, the counsel which I received was, pay, pay, it, pay him off. We sold our car. I took out all my, uh, all my savings. And I took a 100,000 peso, which is, was not much. Uh, 100,000 pesos was maybe uh, $10,000 at that time. Loan out of, out, out of the bank. I paid them off. You say, well, that was bad. But what happened is the guy, the, the people who worked for him got angry because he said, you aren't supposed to touch Stephen. Why can't I touch Stephen? No, you don't touch him. And they all turned against him. And finally one was, got angry enough with him that he shot him ten times. He did not die. And as he was in a coma, God spoke to me and said, go to the hospital and pray for him. So, we went to the hospital and we prayed for him. And we visited him every day until he came out of the coma. And he remembered those prayers. The long and short of it is, is that the violence came. He got very powerful and everything. But the word went out. Stephen and Marcella, you don't touch. Their church, you don't touch. We were building the church building at that time. And people started stealing some rebar. We didn't know that. But stealing two or three re rebars a night, which we had outside the, 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 the church building, which we were building. And we got a phone call one day. 
And they said, they're stealing rebar. They're stealing rebar. And I said, they're stealing rebar? But that, that's God's rebar. And Marcella grabbed the other phone, and she grabbed the other phone. She says, who's stealing rebar? No, no, it's all right. We picked them up. We, we've got them. No, but they've got to give back that rebar. That's God's rebar. No, they took about 10 rebars. Uh, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of that. But don't, don't worry about that. But that's God's rebar, she said. She said, no, 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 don't worry. We've got them here. We've picked them up. We're going to take them out to the desert. We're going to um, give them some tablazos, or they're going to break some two-by-fours over their backs, and, and they won't steal from you anymore. Let's just put it this way. Nobody stole from us anymore. <laughs> what happened? God's a master bringing good out of bad situations. God's a master bringing good out of bad situations. I don't care what your situation is. I don't care what you're going through with your family. I don't care what you're going through with your job. I don't care what you're going through in your health. God is a master bringing good out of bad situations. We can be realistic and be full of faith at the same time. Because so often that when we say you got to be realistic, we're, we're, we're saying you got to be full of fear. And being realistic is believing God and His Word and knowing that His Word is faithful and true. And He will never, never fail. We're never a victim. In God, we are never a victim. We become victors. We can become victimized, but we are not victims. And so, I must realize, number two, as I said, see the good that God is working with us, even in difficult times. Number three, speak words of life and not death. There's four things. Which I, speak words of life and not death. Proverbs 18 Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. You say, oh, that's the verse which Kenneth Copeland says. I'm sorry, that's the verse which the Bible says. I don't care who says it, that's Bible. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary for edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Our words shape us. And many of the corrupt words that we say our words of death. You can't do that. No, that won't work. You really think what's happening with us? We say we want to see miracles, but we don't trust God because we have a plan B. And we should not have a plan B if God fails because God does not fail. James 3 Verses 3 through 6 talks about the tongue. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a source of evil. The tongue, it, it's, it, it's, the, it's the most vile member of our body. Why does God use tongues as a sign of the Holy Ghost? Why does God use tongues? Because it's the most rebellious member we have. When God can control our tongue, He can control our whole being. That's why. We must speak words of life and not of death. Negative people find a problem for every solution. Remember that. But positive people find a solution for every problem. Because as a Christian, I don't have problems. I have opportunities for God to show His power in my life. And every difficulty which can come into my life, it is not a problem which, can, which is going to push me down, but it's an opportunity to show the power of God in my life. I must speak words of life and not of death. Speak over your children. Speak over your health. Speak over your, your, your job. Speak over your church. Speak over your city. Speak over your country. Too often we speak words of death. And number four, number four, remember that God is faithful. Second Thessalonians 3, 3, but the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. How do I make my faith grow? I remember that God is faithful. God is faithful. He will always come through. I could tell a lot of stories, but I don't want to go too long, but God is faithful. God is faithful who has established you. The last one. 
Remember, this world's not my home. We're too stuck on this world. Yes, we have to take care of things. Yes, we have things which God has given into our hands to administer. But remember, we're ministers of what God has given us. We're not owners. We don't own anything. Oh, but I own my house. No, you don't. You're not going to take it with you. It's temporary. You're ministers. This world is not our home. The final chapter is not written. We are living for something eternal and not something temporal. So that when we, things get difficult, we must live our lives a way which honors God and not honors the world. When things get tough, we live a way which honors God in everything we do because heaven is real. And we know that heaven is real. Before my mother passed away, she actually left us two days before she finally went. And we were all gathered around her in the hospital bed and the monitor went flat for at least 10 minutes. Her breathing stopped and everything. You felt as if a presence left the room. And then suddenly, we were still around. The, we didn't go for the doctor. We were just there and thanking God for her life. And then suddenly the monitor came back. That night, I, I stayed with, with, with her that night. And in the morning, she opened up her eyes and she she looked at me and she says, Stephen, who died last night? I said, well, here in the hospital, I don't think anybody died. No, she said, somebody died last night. Who died? I said, Mom, well, I can check, but I don't think. She said, someone died. Who died? I said, Mom, you left us last night. And you came back. And she smiled. And she said, yes. She said, I went through like a tunnel and there's a bright light on the other side and it was beautiful she did not describe what it was she said it was beautiful and two children with the face of Elisa came and said grandma we've been waiting for you we lost two babies she knew of the first one she never knew of the second one there's no way she could have known about that second child but she saw and she said two children came and said, Grandma, we've been waiting for you. Heaven is real. Heaven is real. Second Peter 2.13, nevertheless, we, according to his promise. So if someone come up to the piano, please. Look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, Looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found in him, in peace without spot and blameless. Without spot and blameless. We have a choice of living in fear or living in faith. God has called us to live in faith. But too often we are bound by fear. Something happens in our body, the first thing we think. Heart, cancer. We cough and we say, did I get the virus? And yes, we have to be careful. I'm not saying don't be careful. But we live in a world which is full of fear. Troubling times are coming upon America. I'm just going to prophesy a little bit. Troubling times are coming upon America. America is in a, in a fight for its soul. And the soul is not dependent on who the candidate, which candidate wins. America has walked away from God. America has done sacrifices to Moloch of over 60 million babies. Moloch being the God which they passed the children to the fire.
America has been consumed with goods and filled up with good things. But as a nation, we have begun to trust in our things and not in God. And God is going to bring a shaking upon the nation, which will cause people to look to Him. Cause people to realize that He is the only one who can save them. He's the only one who can change them. He's the only one who, who, who can restore them. Times of troubling shall come upon the nation, but God is saying that His people shall be blessed in the midst of crisis. His people shall have sufficient, not only for themselves, but to give to others in time of crisis. But if we live in fear, we shall not see the plenty of the Lord. And God is calling His church to live in faith and not in fear. Too long we have allowed fear to bind us. We have allowed fear to, to hold us in. We have not seen the great revival which God has for us simply because we are fearful of what people will say about us. It's time for the church to get rid of fear. It's time for the church to stop closing itself in themselves in their homes and saying, I'm not leaving until the pandemic is gone. It's time for the church to stop saying, I need to hold, hold as much money as I can because bad times are coming and, and if I don't have enough money, I won't be able to get through it. I'm sorry, but my God is my source. And God wants us to be free of fear. If today you say, I have fear in my life, I'm fearful for my family, I'm fearful for my kids, I'm fearful for my city, for my country, or for whatever, God wants to free you of that fear right now in Jesus' name. And as they play, if you want to be freed from that spirit of fear and have faith arise in you, just come forward and respond to God. Not to me, to God. Don't come forward waiting to see who's going to pray for you. Come forward and say, Lord, take the fear and fill me with your faith. I believe. I believe in you. If God is speaking to you right now, come in Jesus' name. I'm no longer a slave. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no No. 
Today, as they continue to sing and play, today we hear inside the church, inside the building, and those of you watching online have seen, have heard three different ministers from two different nations give you the same message. And it's not my words, it wasn't Scott's words. It wasn't even Brother Tolman's words. It was the word of God that the great army that Ezekiel saw must assemble here. Once again, it is time, church. It is time to come home. It is time to lay aside our fears, and it is time to come together. If we are to be the church that God called us to be in this end time, and oh, it's full of trouble. It is so full of trouble. But we are called to be the light of the world in, in the darkness. And as the darkness closes in, we are to be the light. So I challenge you, each and every one of you, lay aside your fear. If you're truly a Christian, if you're truly a Christian, and, and I've had COVID-19. We've had members of our church pass away due to COVID-19. But if you are living in Christ, to die is to gain. And the best day of your life is your last day on this planet. I'm not afraid. And I would ask those of you who are members of this church, and you're very faithful, but it is time. It is time for us to be the people that God called us to be. And lay aside our fears, whether they be of social unrest, whether they be of pestilence and disease, whether they be of political unrest, whatever they may be, it's time for us to lay them aside. And it is time for us to come together. It is time for the dry bones to be reassembled. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for that word. Thank you so much for that word. How many of you believe that we need to be partners with this ministry? Amen? I believe that. I believe that. I'm, we're going to do that. I'm just going to speak that right now. We're going we're gonna to do that starting tonight. It is, uh, it's just so refreshing. I've always loved having missionaries and after such a long break without anybody being able to get into the country it's it's so refreshing just to i don't know just to see what god is doing not only here but what god is doing around the world and in these troubling times i believe it's the perfect environment the perfect environment for god to move as a matter of fact probably the best environment for god to move is in times of trouble because people come to God not because everything's going fine. People come to God when they're not. So it's, it's the greatest opportunity that, I've, like I said, I've been alive for 50 years. Greatest opportunity I know in the last 50 years for the kingdom of God to thrive and to grow and to save souls. That's why we were called to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. Hallelujah. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. So very thankful for the word that you've spoken to us all day today and all night. I pray, Lord God, that you would bless the ministry that Brother Tolman has in Mexico. I pray that his steps would be multiplied, and I pray that a great anointing, a greater anointing would be upon his head that he has ever had as he returns to his country. I pray, Lord God, that you would use him in even greater ways than he's ever been used. 
and that the word would go out to the multitudes and that they would hear it and they would receive it. And that this church could be some small part of that. That the membership of this church would join with him and with him with them to carry the truth of the gospel and the mercy of God and his grace and of his power to the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Bless your people. Bless your people all over the world tonight. I, I ask you, Lord Jesus, to bless your people. Make of us what you would have us to be. Forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us and make us instruments of your temple. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Next Wednesday and next Sunday, I think we need to meet here and just fill this house. Fill this house with people and fill this house with praise. God meets me in here every day. And those of you that, that are, haven't been able to come, God misses you being here. And so do we. Your family misses you. We love you very much. And we'll see you soon. God bless you. Brother Tolman, those if you have faith, if you have faith in God, if you've got more faith in God than you have in the devil, more faith in God than you have in your fears, more faith in God than you have in your money, I would like for you to join us in laying hands on Brother Tolman, and I would like for us to bless him. We're going to bless him financially, but I would like us to bless him spiritually and send him away from this church with a fresh anointing, with a, a spiritual anointing that will, that will allow him to go into places that he's never been, to speak to people that he's never spoken to. Let's do that right now.